station. I, at that time, I had some trouble parking. And all right. I, I don't, uh, we all set? Yep. Good morning, everybody. Thanks. Morning. Thanks for coming. Sorry, I missed the email, but I um, I didn't have power. Is that a good enough excuse? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't have power until Tuesday. The derecho, I think, directly hit our neighborhood. Is like every every 100 yards, a huge tree fell, and uh, it was like a, it's crazy. Is that your neighborhood there? No, I don't know where that is. I think that's in Washington D.C. But a, 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 a tree that exactly that size fell one block from my house. Oh, wow. Fell right on the house. Our, we had a tree that got struck by lightning, but it was it wasn't a, it wasn't a big tree. About probably half. Oh, actually, it was about half the size of that tree in in um, diameter. But it crushed my kids' playhouse, so they're really upset. Oh, no. So we had yeah, we had to get rid of it. A little bit sad. Not super sad, but just a little bit sad. What? Is that covered by homeowners? In yeah, you never know. I mean, they say they say fix everything, and then you don't know if they're going to pay or not. That's like you, you know. Gotta get a rider for that. Playhouse rider. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little disconcerting. We'll see. So I'd like to go over um, compression fractures because we see them all the time. It's a really common um, common entity. And um, there are going to be more of them, I would assume, as our population gets older. Uh, the baby boomers, like Adam, get older. And um, are you a baby boomer? No. No? You, are you Generation 68. X? 68? Yeah, I don't know. What do, you, what do you consider yourself? Generation X? I have no idea. No, I, <laughs> I don't. He doesn't believe in labels. But, but, no, I don't. You're the same age as me, so we're some, you're a little younger. I think we're Generation X. So um, every year there's uh, 750,000 fractures in the U.S. alone, which is amazing. It's a lot of people. It's almost a city. And um, from 2001 to 2005, the incidence of vertebroplasties or kyphoplasties doubled. Um, and um, so it's, there's a lot of uh, a lot of these cases are being done. And most of them are being done, I think, by interventional radiologists. Do you know anything about that? She might know better than that. Yeah, there's a lot of interventional radiologists and pain management that also do it. A lot or most, do you know? Who does most of them? Um, interventional radiologists. Most, yeah. So it's mostly done by interventional radiologists, not surgeons. Really? Yeah. So I think they see the fracture, then they say you need a kyphoplasty, and they book it. So it never. An orthopedic consult never gets obtained. Well, somebody refers them to, right. the, you know, the patient isn't presenting to the interventional radiologist. Somebody is referring them to the interventional radiologist. So the first, uh, the first kyphoplast or uh, vertebral plasty was in, Am how do you say that? Amiens, Amiens. Anybody know? Amiens. Amiens, Amiens, France, in uh, 1984. And uh, it was for a tumor. I think it was multiple myeloma. And it makes a lot of sense as you have this um, vertebral body, which is deep within the within the, uh, in the in someone's body cavity. It's very hard to get to either anteriorly or posteriorly. And if you can just percutaneously insert cement into it, it's it's a tremendous advance. You know, it treats the pain, treats uh, stops the collapse. Uh, you can get a biopsy. It's kind of like incredible. And it was introduced into the U.S. and 1990 and the technique um, goes usually through the pedicle and the starting points the way I do it anyway is a superior lateral pedicle and then you very slowly under biplanar fluoroscopic imaging two views um, push the the um, the awl uh, which is what I call it, AWL or you can call it the needle slowly 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 into the vertebral body on the lateral view and on the AP view, you never want it to go uh, medial to this point because if you go inside that point, you'll go into the spinal canal where there is uh, spinal fluid and nerve roots. So it's a very safe procedure, but the, this, uh, this cartoon is kind of like best case scenario. Quite often, you can't see anything. Um, people are osteoporotic. People could be obese and you can't see it on the x-ray. And the most common problem I have is uh, scoliosis. So a lot of these people have scoliosis at the same time, which makes it extremely difficult. But if you can, if you can recreate it in your mind's eye, um, you can still do it. 
but it does uh, carry some risks uh, anatomically if you to get it in the right place. So, any questions about the technique? How you do it? Okay. And now, this vertebral plasty, by definition, is just sticking cement into the bone. Kyphoplasty is a trademarked uh, term um, by Kyphon, where you, uh, by definition, you inflate a balloon and then insert cement where the balloon was. And I think the biggest, the biggest reason to uh, insert the balloon is it creates a cavity where the, where the cement will flow. Otherwise, there is a chance that the cement could flow somewhere else. And the cement will flow, you know, path of least resistance into the cavity and not somewhere else. And the two areas that can go is uh, into the venous system and then lungs and cause a pulmonary embolism, just like in the total hip replacement, which can be fatal. Uh, or it could go into the <coughs> spinal canal, which could cause a nerve injury. So those are the two areas you don't want it to go. So any questions about the different types? So they're really the same thing, except for the, the kyphoplasty, you, you insert the balloon and you make it bigger. And kyphoplasty is uh, Kyphon, which is um, a Medtronic uh, company that was bought out, I think, two years ago. So any questions about kyphoplasty, vertebral plasty? So, Uh, well, um, I think I've never, I've never failed inserting the balloon. Okay. You mean, is there one reason to do one and not the other? Yeah. I think they're interchangeable. So it, I don't think it makes a difference. It's just a different technique. So I don't know why people do vertebral plasties. I, I feel that it's, it's uh, better to do the kyphoplasty because you have this, uh, this void. So it helps you decrease the probability, even though it's extremely small, the probability of cement going somewhere else. You're watching it intraoperatively on the C-arm, but you can't see well sometimes. And it's also, isn't it, it's an extra step, right? That you gotta do the balloon and then you're also, pretend, I mean, I thought the, fr the first theory about using the balloon was actually was not to create the cavity, but was to expand the, kind of like a jack lifting up a car. Right. Was to lift up that collapsed. Was column. to make it from collapsed into non-collapsed or yeah. straight. That's been proven it doesn't work. Right, but that was the That was theory. the initial theory, yeah. yeah. That was the theory about doing it. Yeah, it's been proven it and I remember the, in an academy meeting in 2003 they proved that it didn't didn't help. And then one of the surgeons who's on the Kaifon uh, advisory board stood up and he found a lot of uh, um, errors in the research, but he was completely wrong. I mean, the research was done perfectly. It doesn't help, and I've never seen it to help. But the, the fracture does reduce just by laying the patient on certain rolls by, and then you put them to sleep, it's, should they straighten out. So you got, it's like from a three-point bend, if you, if you put them like, kind of like the span of a bridge, if you put them on, and, and then the crooked part becomes straight. So, so the benefit of these things is it's a percutaneous procedure and then the patients get immediate pain relief because the cement hardens within a minute. So it's, it's, it can be a great procedure for some people, but you can still treat these things non-operatively and with a brace. And the, and the negative is, well, as therapists, do you think these things work? You guys see them all the time. Yeah, all the time. Yes. Yes. Really? So you find it's a dramatic improvement after the kyphal I have a specific example. I know I have an, an <coughs> independent active 101 year old that I was seeing in the home. She had a fall. She had a depression fracture in AP. Or because of her age, the doctor did not consult for the consultation for her kyphal. Uh -huh. um, she ended up, because she was in so much pain, gave me a car at narcotics, went to SAR, ended up with pneumonia, gone in six months. And here was a 101 year old that was totally independent, not even really with a walker, but I was really Mm-hmm. I wish we could get the consults more for you. Mm-hmm. I think that's what we're missing is, we were talking about this the other day. If in fact it's a, they know that it's a fracture, why aren't they consulting those orthos that actually do the kyphos? Why are they going outside of that person? Code blue you know, you A, all cook. clear. Why are they just going to your doctor? Code blue A, all clear. Well, who do they else do they consult? 
Do doctors that don't, oh, they don't, I don't know, the internal medicine doctors, they just consult somebody to get rid of this problem. They don't. But then they, they call Ed, Ed calls me, you want to do this, so it still works out. No, you can't charge a double consult. Yeah. Medicare only pays for one orthopedic consult. If they pay us anything at all. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. 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 I would just say, with the kyphoplasty, it, it almost is pain management. I mean, and, and certainly what we see. Yeah. Pain management, because there are people who come in. It's exactly what it is for pain, yeah. And, you know, if, if they can get through that acute phase, um, you know, a lot of times just with bracing, um, Bracing works too. And the right. problem is elderly people do not do well with opium. Well. Yeah, they don't tolerate opiates at all. <laughs> yeah. So some, it can work really well. Okay, so, so any other comments about? So let's, uh, let's do an illustrative case because cases are really fun because they're real people, real cases, and you will learn from them. 82-year-old woman that had severe low back pain. She had an injury, 5-12-12, which is um, about eight weeks ago. She missed a step, fell on her backside. She came to the office four days later. I saw her, she had terrible back pain. So I discussed with her, she had a, um, a fracture. Um, she, has, um, she, was re she was then, uh, she failed non-operative treatments of pain medicine and eventually was admitted due to worsening pain six, seven, twelve. Her past medical history, she had an L4 fracture and I did a kyphoplasty, but she also had concomitant stenosis. At the same time, I did a decompression, 11-15-07. And she did great for eight months but then her sciatica came back, and then I needed, and did not get better, and then I did a revision decompression L3 to L5 with a fusion. Um, and then she also has a history of thoracic fractures, which were treated non-operatively, just pain medicine, uh, in February 2011, and she has fractures at T3, T4, T2, T3, T4, T6. She has multiple fractures. So she has uh, severe osteoporosis. So what do you think of the films there, um, Adam? This is our presenting film. So it looks like L3, L4, L4, L5, L4, S1, perhaps, posterior fixation. Uh, L3, I'll tell you because I know L3 to L5. Oh, L3 to L5, mm -hmm. okay. Um, then she's also got the aortic stent graft in there for her abdominal aortic aneurysm. And uh, then it looks like the bone cement is at uh, L4. I'll show you a better picture. Any scoliosis or anything like that? No, not really. Any fractures that you can see? Yeah, there's uh, what? So let's see if that's if that's. Let's see if you turn the knob down. Is that the volume? Um, so you said it's L three, four, five. So two, one, twelve is fractured. <coughs> I think eleven, eleven and twelve look fractured. Yeah. Okay, this is a lateral view. So yep. you can see then the L three. You can see the the superior end plate fracture. L4, um, you can see all that bone cement in there, very anterior within the vertebral body, extending out beyond the mm -hmm. anterior end plate. Mm -hmm. um, and then up higher, I guess, three. So you can see there's three, two, one, 12. You can see 12's uh, fracture. 12 is some type of fracture. Okay. And you can't tell acuity. I have no idea. Can't tell in the x ray? Yeah. Okay. All right. She had a bone, her injury was 514. She was admitted to Hartford because she couldn't walk. And she had a bone scan. All right, so uh, bone scan, what you look for with bone is uh, uptake of the osteoblast <coughs> or the osteoclast to make bone. So 12, you can see there is some activity there. Yep, and then up higher, um, I can't tell from, the, it looks like actually that's more manubrium from because of that down bottom left image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you can see that it's anterior, it's not posterior, so that's mm -hmm. not in the spine. Okay. But then on that one on the right there, um, yeah, there, there's, you can see she's kyphotic and mm -hmm. she has some additional uh, activity. For but this is the manubrium? It, it can't tell, but I, it could be within the spine. Okay. So you would read this as a T12 fracture? How about you can't see well, it here? Yeah, but it, uh, how far, she's kyphotic, how far away, that's an anterior one and mm -hmm. a posterior, so it's how far away it is from the camera. So this, if you're closer to the camera, it's better? Right. Okay. Right, it's closer, so the activity is taken up. Okay. But it's not really that bad. You know, I would expect it to be a big black, you know, huge. It's not that bad, huh? So it's not that bad. Okay. Now would you still call it a fracture? Um, I would question it. Okay. Yeah. So she had an MRI um, three weeks later after that bone scan. All right. So now you can see it, that T12 vertebral body, it is an acute fracture because it's white. 
that white is edema. You can look above and below and see mm -hmm. how it's dark. This is a fat suppressed image. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see CSF is white. Mm -hmm. um, the, the edema within the subcutaneous fat is white and the marrow edema within the acute fracture is white. Mm -hmm. And how about how about way up high. how about this is a bad fracture too? It's a bad fracture, you tell the doctor to fix this. It's not acute because there's no edema in it. There's no edema in it, so it doesn't increase signal. But it's deformed. It's deformed. It's mm -hmm. going through the posterior margin. It's extending into the mm -hmm. spinal canal. How long does it take for the edema of a fracture to go away? For you to say it's acute? Do you have any? I mean, I don't know if you yeah, know. Yeah, I, I would. I, I, I. This is my guess. I don't have good, but I would say a month. So in a month. Probably. In a month, usually. So you break your spine, and you get an MRI two months later, and then MRI should look normal? Um, I mean, bone healing, our, our number that we use from rat fibulas, uh, not from, from rabbit fibulas, is six weeks. So if we break a, if we break a uh, rabbit fibula in half with our hands, come back six weeks later and try to break it again, it'll break in a different place. So that's where we come up with six weeks. Bones basically heal in about six weeks. So. So you think if six weeks later that edema will be totally gone and bone will be healed? It won't be totally gone, but it'll be um, much more normal. Okay. So and the other the other issue is if you well I get if you break it and you keep stressing on it, uh -huh. it's going to take it's going to take longer to heal. Like and a so, non-union? <coughs> yeah, that there, you're going to be if you're continuously putting that pressure. But on you it, are if you if you're up in a if, if you it's move. In the spine, yeah. Unless you're in bed. Right. Well, is that a heat white still at that point? If you're still subjecting it to that stress, will it still present as acute or will it not? I don't know what you mean by present. Well, look, will it look, I think she wants to say, is it, does it look white on the MRI yeah. Yeah. if It'll someone keeps active? It'll be white, not as white. Okay. It'll be l l duller. Okay. Yeah. How about... Six weeks, is that your time frame? When you move from the fall to time frame to do a kind of or is there a little time? The time, there's no, there's no rule. The time frame is when you want to do it. So it's basically you tell the person you if your pain is severe you could do it day one, but in, after about a year or so it's got to be healed. So I have seen cases where doctors do the kyphoplasty and, and with uh, like on, on cases like this where the MRI looks normal and it's basically healed and they shouldn't have done that because it's not going to help. After two months it still may be painful. So it could be a non-union, a spinal non-union, and still, still edema and, and, uh, and the periosteum gets inflamed. So what about this for you, uh, Adam? So uh, this, you can, this is. It looks like the CSF is still white. So there's uh, that T12 vertebral body. It, it's uh, healing. And I, I, that bright area in there, I don't know what that is. This is the same time. This is the same time frame as oh, this it's one. The same study. Yeah. These are, yep. I'm going to show you this one, this one, this one, this one. Uh, yeah, those are the three you get. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it up with that. Ad. Yeah. Um, well, how about the fracture here? Well, I think that's a hemangioma. Okay. Yeah, and so that's just some. Uh, I, that's probably blood. That bright in T12. Mm -hmm. It's probably blood. This is probably blood right here? Yeah, as to why it's bright. And then the rest is kind of dark because I'm guessing this is dead T1. So that mm -hmm. that is uh, blood or it could have been fat that was already there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, could have had a human, you could fracture a vertebral body with a hemangioma. So she did not have a hemangioma because I've, I've seen her before. So that's probably blood. Okay. And now here is a, a, a T2 and you can see the, the, the big thing that I'm learning from this picture is the posterior margin of the vertebral body is involved with mm -hmm. the fracture and there's extension of bone mm -hmm. in the spinal canal, mm -hmm. a body displacing and deforming the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. The cone is right there. So by definition, if it goes backwards, it's a um, burst fracture, but it's not a true high, le high energy burst fracture like a young person. Uh -huh. These are low energy injuries usually and they're usually uh, quite stable and they don't move around. How about the CAT scan? So the CAT scan, again, you can see the bone extending posteriorly into the spinal canal, the loss of height mm -hmm. in the vertebral body. Mm -hmm. <coughs> How about the coronal? Coronal, the loss of height, the, the um, involvement of the side to side, you know, end plate, the, the side partial portions of the vertebral mm -hmm. body, loss of height. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, if, the, if the bone goes posterior, it means there's a crack there and there's a possibility that cement could go right. backwards within the spinal canal. Yes. And that's a, that's a relative contraindication for um, 
kyphoplasty, especially for interventional radiologists. But I think for spine surgeons, uh, we're more comfortable with that because we'll just open the spinal canal uh, if we need to. So it's not, I don't think it's much of a big deal. So how about the exo cut? Anna? So there you can see the, um, the spinal canal stenosis. Mm -hmm. And that that is bone extending back. Should be like this. Now. So it's just this piece here that's between yeah, the right pedicles. There, you can mm -hmm. see a little bit of gas, like right up, 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 no, no down, up, half. Oh. That? No, more in front where the bone. I'm this? trying to say where the end of the no, where the end of the vertebral body is and where the fracture is. I'm trying here? to guess. Yeah, I'm guessing it's about there. All right, maybe. That's my guess is that how far back. How about is. this view, Adam? So this is a T1. The CSF is black, and you can see the T12 vertebral body is black. Uh, mm -hmm. because of the edema within it and the fracture. Do you think this is from tumor? No. Okay. It's not expansile at all. There you can just see uh, how much of a mess that you can't see CSF. Mm -hmm. You can see maybe that's the cord or the conus medullaris, the little dark mm -hmm. area okay. um, in the canal, so mm -hmm. it's stenotic. This is at L2, L3. This is the first level above the surgery, so, so there's spinal few, canal stenosis there. So there's some stenosis here. Yeah, the a spinal lot of canal. CSF is pushed here, out. Here's three. Where it's open, mm -hmm. you can see all the little nerves. In here's there. two, you can three. See how narrow it is. So she's got, you would say, moderate spinal canal stenosis. Moderate spinal canal stenosis at L2, L3, which is the next level up from her fusion. And that's what the spinal canal should look like. And she, so she's got stenosis there too. And the stenosis wasn't from the fracture, so. What do we do now? So what what do you think, Dr. Dinkar? What what would you do? I know you're not a spine surgeon, but just for fun and uh, for the conference. <laughs> She's got spinal stenosis at L203, above her previous fusion. She's 82, she has some mild dementia. Um, she's a community ambulator, so she's, she walks around, she likes to go to the store and take care of her house. And she's got a fracture at L2 and she's not getting better. Try with kyphoplasty and decompression. Mm -hmm. Kyphoplasty with decompression, which is a. So, any anybody have any other thoughts or questions? What anybody would do? We, I mean, I think just from coming to this conference with you and how you present the case, I I think that's what you do end up doing on her. But I think there's a lot to be said for just uh, kyphoplasty in her because that's why she's presenting. That's what the problem is that mm -hmm. of, of why she's there is for the pain of the fracture, mm -hmm. not because of the spinal canal stenosis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right, Adam, you, you, um, <coughs> you think you know me, but you don't know me. You guess wrong. <laughs> 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 but I, I, I always throw it back to the family. I was like, we can do the least amount or we can fix both. And, and I said, and I asked them, this is the question I asked them is before the fall, how was mom doing? And they said, she was fine. So it's like, it's probably all fracture. Um, and that's the basis of our decision. So this is the kyphoplasty. Is you can see the size of these instruments. They're about, I don't know, three or four millimeters or so. And you stick it into the vertebral body and then uh, you uh, open it with the balloon. And then very slowly, this is cement. This is like halfway through the procedure. You can see the cement starting to fill the vertebral body and it's getting farther and farther posterior. And you never want to go past this point because that's where the spinal canal is. So we do it slowly, 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 and keep taking images. And here's the end. Uh, the T12 vertebral body is now pretty much full with cement. And here's the front view. There's a lot of cement there, but it's, it, it looks here, the vertebral body looks totally filled, but really it's just, it's the anterior two thirds of the vertebral body. So this is what it looks like afterwards. And uh, this is a post-op film. Uh, this is actually, no, this is, um, I don't know what this is, post-op film. So she did, the patient did great. So the, the next question everybody's was like, how'd the patient do? The patient did great, but last night she called me and now she said she's got terrible sciatica. So I called in, just if you guys are curious, I called in a steroid pack and we'll see how things happen. Sometimes you can just manage stenosis non-operatively. But maybe in retrospect, I should have done both. I don't know. But I like to. I frequently like to do things in piecemeal too. So, so any questions about that? Now, what about um, why do both sides? Hasn't it been shown that the pain relief can come from just doing one side? Yeah, I'm. I um. Yeah, you can do one-sided. So there is evidence uh, in within the literature that one side's enough. And then and then the question is, where's the pain coming from? 
So, so we know from many, from from uh, from a lot of different aspects of, of spine surgery that the pain <coughs> comes from the end plates and it comes from the periosteum. Within the vertebral body itself, there are no nerve endings, so there's no pain within the vertebral body itself. It's like a cube. So the middle doesn't have pain, but the outside has pain. So. I think you have to fill up as much of where the fracture is around the end plate and around the periosteum as you can to get as much pain relief as possible. So, but they found like one's enough, but um, I feel that's kind of like a lazy man's uh, approach. Like, my, why not do two? It's not that much more risks. It's not that, unless, as long as it goes smoothly. So if two goes very smoothly, I do two, just to optimize the probability that there is good pain relief. But if I have problems, uh, then I think one is sufficient. So I, I do two, but. And you do them at the same time, though. You agree uh -huh. with one and the other. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there is some evidence that one's enough. But it's just it's one piece of one piece of information. I mean, who knows? Only God knows the truth, like what you should really be doing in every case. And so, if, as long as it's simple, why not maximize the patient's uh, probability of good outcome? That's why I do two. But sometimes I do one if I have a problem, like if one doesn't go well, if there's a problem, then I just do one. To answer your question, okay. So, um, so any other comments on that? Very good. Okay, here's another um, interesting case. It's an 85 year old man. Uh, man with an injury 8810, he, he stooped down to pick up a paper and immediately ha had pain. He couldn't get up. He went to the emergency room, went to pain management, they gave him a bunch of shots, steroids in the back. Um, he, he then saw me 10-20-10, um, which is about two months after the injury. He has a history of prostate carcinoma treated with chemo about 20 years ago. So what are your thoughts uh, here, Adam? It's a L, there's an L2 fracture, and mm -hmm. again, it involves, it's, it's not a wedge fracture because it involves the posterior margin of the vertebral body with extension into the spinal canal okay. and loss of height. Is this cancer? No, I don't think so. The, you, there's no erosion of the cortex. It's very symmetric. It's, mm -hmm. There's nothing expansile. It's not, um, so I don't think it's cancer. Okay, how about down here? Does that look normal? No, he uh, probably has pars fractures. Okay, right here. He has pars fractures, yeah. Okay. L5 and an anterior listhesis of 5 on 1. Okay. And it's very chronic with a lot of remodeling. He's got this big osteophyte, really, right, from the yeah. from the stress of the L5 going anterior. So here's 4-5, Adam, what it's do you think? showing a, a moderate to severe spinal canal, probably severe spinal canal stenosis. Mm -hmm. um, with the set arthropathy, ligamental thickening. Mm -hmm. Here's the ligament and flavum. Yeah. And the, um, the facets the have fluid. some fluid in it. Yeah. How about, what do you think of sagittal cuts? So you can see the fracture in the L2 and how it's extending back, and then you can see spinal canal stenosis at 4-5 and 5-1. So you have the 4-5 stenotic, and 5-1 has a little bit of spondylolisthesis, right? Yeah. Okay, can you tell how old it is by the MRI or no? No. Well, again, it's um, what do you, no. what word do you use? No. no. You say you say acute, a subacute, or I would recent? for this one, I would say subacute because it isn't completely white, the vertebral body. It, okay. It's it, it looks like there's some healing to it. It still has some areas of edema, but okay. Just so you just put this in your data banks. The injury we said was um, two months. This is over two months. Yeah, eight, eight, ten, and this is ten, fifteen, ten. So this is what fractures looks like two months out. How about here, Adam? So there, it's, it, on the, especially that left image is much wider. Again, it, the window level is not quite right because it's it's a little bright. But mm, this MRI may be calling you a liar because this is really bright. Looks acute, doesn't it? But well, we know it's two months. It's the the window leveling is you know you can change it. It's it's uh, it, this is too white for how I would set my window level. You can't see in the spinal canal where the CSF is is mm. white. You can't see through it. And I like to be able to see through it. If it's white and bright like that, mm -hmm. so that you can't see through it, then it, you're missing something by the window. When you say see through it, you want you mean see the nerves? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, see the nerves. See other stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't. You, you can't have it so bright. Yeah. How about this view, Adam? What do you think? And then it's it's just showing the fracture. That's Is this cancer? I don't think so. No. Why do you say that? I'm just curious. It's too uniform, and the cortexes are intact. There's no a cancer usually doesn't infiltrate every single millimeter of the vertebral body, and the vertebral body is so homogeneous in its signal intensity that I don't think it's cancer. Okay, so um, so the same problem with this man is he has concomitant stenosis, L5 S1 spondylolisthesis, and this new fracture, and he decided he just wanted the fracture fixed. 
So 10, 28, 10, he wasn't getting better, terrible pain. This is the starting point. See the superior, la superior lateral portion of the pedicle with the, with the uh, I just used a scalpel just to point to where it is. And then here's the balloon and it has these two little dots. And then you push the fluid in and, and you can see a big black area where the balloon is. And then fill it up, fill as much as you can with cement on both sides. But he did better, but he returned 3, 8, 11, which is, uh, surgery was 10, 28, 10. So he came back a year later and he was having terrible back and leg pain, buttock, posterior thigh pain, he had sciatica. So he came back a year later and I did an L4 or 5 decompression. Uh, and he did reasonably well from that. So again, I probably should have done it at the same time. But I think, I think when you do big surgeries, it increases your complication rates. Better to do things in stages. The opposite side of the coin in that is, um, well, you're just prolonging people's agony. Just get it over with. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. So, any questions about that case? I didn't order that bone scan. Uh, I think MRI is sufficient. So, MRI should give us an idea. Usually, the radiologists can understand if it's cancer or not. Don't you think, uh, Adam? We're MRI is sufficient. You know, right here, it's easy for me to make to say no. This is not cancer because there's nothing on the line. Right? How about uh, how about when you're in the room actually looking at it and you get that history of cancer? We're a lot less confident than I am being in this. You want to be safe. You want to make sure you don't miss it. If someone has cancer, should I always order die? That helps, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Although you know, in the setting of fracture, fractures enhance. You know, and so. I think the bigger thing with the with the the, the, the contrast is find, seeing it in other areas. You know, often if there's metastatic prostate cancer to the spine, it's not just going to be in that one vertebral body that fractured. It's going to be elsewhere. You can see other so lesions you'll be able easier. To see other lesions, yeah. Okay. Okay. Next case is 79 year old man with low back pain, left greater than right sciatica. What are your thoughts here? So uh, he's got four and two, or uh, he's got fractures. So superior amplate of L4 is compressed and L2 is compressed. Can you tell if it's either superior or inferior end plate or both? It's both, I think. It's yeah. both, okay. We can't tell Let's the see, from oh, that. you were wrong, Adam. What do you think of the MRI? <laughs> so, uh, superior end plate of, uh, of four, uh -huh. um, and then uh, it's chronic in two. I mean, that's a old Schmoll's node. I think that's more of a Schmoll's node? Yeah, yeah. Okay, on these views, and I thought maybe a little bit of stenosis, yeah, at maybe a three, four, four, five. Right, and posterior extension of the bone too, and at four. At four. With, with that into the canal, definitely stenosis there. Definitely a three, four stenosis. Mm -hmm. See the canal four, small. Five stenosis. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. The canal's a little bit small there. Um, uh oh. What's a schmoral snap? Who's the say? Yeah, I. It, to me, it is the the you know the the disc is the annulus fibrosus, okay, the ring of fibrous tissue around the outside, and then there's the pulpa, nucleus pulposus in the middle, which is the Dr. Scholl's gel. Um, Mr. David, okay. you have a nice... So what I think of it is that gel has herniated through and caused a fracture to the end plate and is bulging up into the vertebral body. This is a common degenerative change. It's very, it's kind of like a very slow fracture, right? Yeah, it's, I, it's, I think of it as a fracture. Yeah, absolutely. very slow fracture, yeah. yeah. The disc kind of like erodes into the vertebral body from weakness. You don't see it in kids. So what do you think of the canal at L1, L2, Adam? It's beautiful, wide open, you know, a little. Wide open at L1, L2, yeah. okay. How about at three four? It's stenotic and it's there's it's I would say you know the the three things of disc thickened ligament and mm -hmm. facet arthropathy. So facet ligament and disc. That's the that's yeah. the triad. Yeah. And how about four five? Uh, the same thing. Not not mm -hmm. as severe. Not as not severe. As with. And then the fourth thing often is malalignment that can contribute that mm -hmm. he didn't have. But. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for this man, because of this. Um, to, I thought this was a fracture, but maybe I'm wrong. But I decided to do kyphoplasty here, kyphoplasty here, and decompress him from L3 to L5. And you can see here my trough from the decompression. I did this left-sided approach, and then I decompressed the spinal canal. You know how I do a unilateral approach, bilateral decompression. So I decompressed him and put cement into the vertebral bodies. And um, this man did tremendous. He like bounced back very, very quickly. 
Uh, but that's not always the case. I mean, sometimes people don't bounce back quickly. Hmm? I said, of course, he's not 40. <laughs> he's, uh, those are the, those are the no, he's 79. He's 79. Yeah. But he bounced back very quickly. Actually, for 79, this man's very, very vibrant. Um, yeah. Huh? Our middle-aged are the ones that we have the most problems. Middle-aged people do worse? They're, they're men. Men. Not, middle-aged men. They what do you got against middle-aged men? What are you talking about? We're tough as nails. <laughs> I don't believe that. Middle-aged men are tough. Okay, one more case is a um, 65-year-old woman with multiple myeloma yeah. and low back pain. And this is her x-rays. What do you think, Adam? L3 has a superior end plate fracture. Okay. Um, How about the MRI? Yeah, MRI, there's a fracture there, and there's a posterior extension in the mm -hmm. spinal canal. And, so it's an acute fracture? there's some edema there. It's not, not a lot. Well, is this bad. multiple myeloma? I don't think so, but... All right, how about this view? Does that change your view, change your perspective? I would, again, I don't think it is multiple myeloma, yeah. Okay, so um, this is from an old one. So she had a cement augmentation, and I sent the biopsy, because I don't trust radiologists, and it was sure. negative. <laughs> and you're there, why not? And you're there, and also a history of multiple myeloma, yeah. I think you yeah, to the patient. I absolutely agree. Okay, so, so any questions about uh, kyphoplasty? So we, we did a whole bunch of I cases. Guess my question is, you did a, a, a talk on this a while ago, where you talked about Have things study. changed? You, you talked about the study that people were doing, you know, showing it that it's a sham surgery. Let me, let me, let me go over that real okay. quick and ask your question in a second. So just to review, this has been studied. Now it's been some time. It was 2009. Okay. It's been, it's been a, two years since the, the previous uh, um, um, conference that we had. And just to, review, just to review everything for people, it was in New England Journal of Medicine. So we have a rule in orthopedics is that if there's an orthopedic study in the New England Journal of Medicine, it says that surgery doesn't work. Because just it's a guaranteed. It's never because that's all they ever published. They never published that orthopedic surgery does great. And um, so they did a randomized trial of vertebroplasty versus sham, sham surgery. They did. They had four sites, um, uh, and uh, they had a randomized parallel group placebo where they took people to the OR, cut their skin, put in a needle, and then opened the cement up so they could smell it. But they didn't do the surgery, and they said they did it. Uh, over four years, and they tested it. Yeah, and they had them walk. They had all sorts of stuff. Uh, and out of 468 people during that time period, only 78 wanted the surgery, and they split them up: 38 versus placebo. And this is like pain. There's absolutely no difference. Um, quality of life, no difference. Pain at night, no difference. Uh, pain score and function score. And in, in the same in the same art article, the same journal, uh, same time, there's another study, August 6, 2009 again, same time period, and it, these, it was supported by a grant from the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Skin Disease, the government, because the government's paying for these kyphoplasties. And basically, whenever um, an industry, anybody, who, whoever pays for the study, the results are what they want, you know, right? I mean, that's cynical, but. So it was a multi, this was a multi center, five from the UK, five from the US, one from Australia. Same thing, but there are 68 vertebrates, 63, 63 simulated procedures. You had to have a three out of 10 pain to get into the study. So obviously if you have a fracture and you have no pain, you don't need surgery, so they didn't include those people. And they found that if they did exactly the same. The only difference was there was a higher crossover rate in the vertebral plasty group. So you say, what's crossover? Crossover is, um, to be fair to these people, you say, look, you're gonna have sh sham surgery or you're gonna have the regular surgery. After a month, it, we're not gonna tell you what you had, but if you're really unhappy, you can go into the other group. So some of the people who had the normal surgery went into the sham group, and some people that had the sham surgery went into the vertebral plasty group. Interesting, right? Even though the patients did exactly the same, 60, um, there are a higher crossover rate at three months. So 43% of the sham surgery people said, I'm, not, I'm no better, I want the other one. And 12% of the, the people who had the right surgery, they said, I want the sham surgery. So, but, but, but clinically, everything else was the same. So it's, it, that's kind of an interesting um, finding of the study. Um, and then they said, um, at two weeks, they said, guess which one you had. The people that had um, the correct surgery, the vertebroplasty, the cement, 63% said, I know I had the cement. But the, you know, also like whatever, um, 63, but it's not everybody. It's like 37 guessed wrong. And then of the people who had the sham surgery, 
it was a coin toss. They they sometimes said yes, sometimes they said no. So basically, they didn't know. But still, 50% is pretty good. But you would think everybody said I didn't get it. And there was one fecal sac injury with the vertebral plasty. So there are risks associated with the procedure. This is how they studied them with the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire and asked questions like, do you need a handrail? Uh, do you have to hold on to something to sit in a chair? You find it difficulty to turn over in beds. It kind of shows you like how well people are doing. That's what they used. So since then, uh, we're done that. Since then, there have been no new studies, but the rate of, I think, kyphoplasties has dramatically decreased. When I ballpark asked the kyphon guys, they say like at least 30% after these studies. And there's been no new studies other than one from that was funded by Medtronic, who owns kyphon. And that study in cancer patients uh, showed that patients did a lot better. They left the hospital, went home, uh, they had less pain. But again, it was funded by Medtronic. So, who sells Kaifon? What are you seeing long term? Me personally, my opinion, I this is how I practice medicine. I throw it back to the patient. I say some people, some people do better, some people don't. And I say to people, if you're comfortable, don't have the procedure because you're going to get better. But some see some of these people are demented, and they you can't even talk to them, and they're just laying in bed. So you have to be you know, veterinary medicine. You just have to watch them. Some, and some people uh, are obese and they just can't move because of the pain. And you just see them sitting in bed, they're just gonna get a blood clot, pneumonia, ulcer. I think, yeah, and I think braces do not work well in adults. They only work well in kids. Um, obviously there's some cases that do work, but it's very difficult when you're elderly to have a brace. It's just, it's very uncomfortable. You see it's riding up on their necks, they're complaining, they take it off, they don't wear it right. It's, it's a they're bony, it digs into their sternum, they put like wash rags in there, it's like, it's chaos, it just doesn't work well. I think it's either you, you don't have, you just do without it and, and you get better or you don't. Well, and then I think too, on, for the older population with the pain meds, then they get more confused and then I it's horrible. risk for falling because they're so sleepy. It's horrible, they talk out of their heads, the family's upset, they don't recognize their children, it's a disaster. Yeah. Opium doesn't work in those people. But some people, they do well, and then the kyphoplasty, some patients do incredible. But I, I don't know I don't know what the right answer is. I think sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know, does anybody else have any thoughts about it? Spiro, what have you seen either uh, through observation or in the literature? Uh, and I know we discussed this before when you gave this presentation in the past. Uh, <coughs> I mean, when you put that methyl methacrylate in, in there. Yeah, uh, polymethyl methacrylate. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, and a lot of these patients are osteoporotic anyway. It's mm -hmm. causing compression fractures. Uh, superior in other places, or, yes. In other places. Mm -hmm. I've seen that, and it's been studied, but I'm not sure what the answer is. But I, I've seen multiple fractures. And whether that was a cause of the vertebral plasty or just a natural progression of the disease, nobody knows, but it's possible. But it would make sense that right. that area is relatively stronger. But it usually, I've never seen a fracture exactly next to it. You would think that they would fracture exactly next to it, right. next to the relative area of strength. You know, like like people uh, break uh, above plates. Uh, so I'm not sure. It's probably just a natural um, disease progression. I think the only risk is the immediate risk from surgery is a blood, is a um, as a neurological injury, uh, a, a CSF leak, or um, a, a pulmonary embolism from the cement. You know, you know the, whole, the way cement works is the cement. It's not the actual cement that goes, I think, into the vein, veins, but but the uh, cascade of inflammation in the lungs, it shuts down the lungs and people can die. From I've had a case um, at home on an x-ray somewhere of a, of a cast of glue, glue. I mean cement in the lung. Mm -hmm. And it was people, it was when a, a fluoroscopic CT scanner came out and they decided they were going to do a vertebral plasty with a, in the, in, on the CT scanner where, so that they could, you know, kind of like what you have in the OR now. Uh -huh. um, and this was an interventional radiologist and they, uh, you know, the, they did the case case went fine, sent the patient back up to the floor, patient's up on the floor and it's like two days later and you know for whatever reason the medicine team taking care of him decides to get a chest x-ray and he came back down for a chest x-ray and there in his uh, left lower lobe was the outline of the pulmonary artery filled with cement and you know he was it, it, he, it was it wasn't really, he wasn't there for short of breath. He wasn't there for, you know, the chest x-ray wasn't there for a pulmonary embolism. It was unrelated. He, you know, was doing fine. 
but it was a matter, I think, of sort of seeing the, the trees for the forest, that they were so focal on looking at exactly where they were that with fluoroscopy you're seeing a... Oh, they're looking at the CAT scan of the body. Yeah, yeah. They're, since they're looking at the CAT scan, they're looking at these thin slice of where the glue is going in, not seeing the, the tail end that it was going off in a vein. Yeah, we all ultimately do. Fine. Fine. I mean, he, you know, our lungs are, you know, you can, you can lose a segment of lung and still do fine. I don't think they die from the block. They die from the inflammatory cascade. Does, my, does anybody have any, any uh, information about that? That's what I think. I know that's how in orthopedics that's how that's how patients die from cement and total hips, is uh, is is an inflammatory cascade within the lungs, and patients die from cement sometimes. It's very rare, but it happens. It's like internal shunts in, in the lung, or is this different? What is it? You get it. You get a. I think you get a functional pulmonary embolism from a, a from the inflammatory cascade within the lungs. From the and, cement, and it's uh, I, and I've heard of a case and saw some pictures in a lecture where the um, a doctor had done like four or five vertebral bodies in a, on the same patient at the same time, and so it's almost like it's the glue overload. It, it's that's toxic. a high right. That's a high. That's definitely known risk factor more than yeah, one. Yeah, and it, it is because you know there's whatever it is that's evaporating or you know, drying out from the of the cement that I think gets to toxic levels and is sort of poison. Yeah, And, yep. and I think, like you say, it induces an infl inflammation in the bloodstream. Yeah, like a bee sting gives you, you know, swelling everywhere. You know, I think kind of, I think that's a, maybe an analogy. Okay, any other questions? As far as aspirin therapy, once you do the procedure, is there any time frame? Really? Go for it. Go for right it. away, yeah. yeah. Once you have the procedure, just go for it. Yeah. Push them hard. <laughs> What else? Any other uh, comments or questions? Or? All right. I'm sorry, Spiro. That's my flag, guys. Do you want to see this a little history? See that? That's Spiro oh, okay. Antonitis. <laughs> and I bought this flag for my children. It's the Roland Park. Um, uh, it's the Roland Park Fourth of July parade, where like 5,000. Basically, it's uh, 500 kids on bicycles. <laughs> and um, and I uh, I bought this flag for the parade. I uh, bought on Amazon.com. We're all holding it, and uh, What's it's kind of that thing? Uh, 15 by 25 feet. Okay. And uh, Betsy Ross had that in stock. Yeah. What? <laughs> BetsyRoss.com. And that's that's my that's my daughter's um, former best friend. Like in her other school, she was riding underneath the flag. Falling out. Yeah, and that's my that's my daughter right there. All the kids were there. The kids were riding their bikes underneath the flag. It was like a lot of fun. <laughs> At the very end of the parade, there's a um, the fire engine has like a uh, mists everybody, so it's a, they're all soaked and they're running around going crazy. It's a great parade. <laughs> you guys ever want to go? That's my wife right there. She didn't want to do it, but she eventually <laughs> gave in. All right, thanks everybody for coming. Hey, thank you. See you next yeah. month.